beautiful waters of Loch Etiv, hemmed in by high mountains, lie at the center of a landscape that fuels the imagination. There's an almost primeval feeling about this place. The shores are wild and inhospitable and steeped in Celtic myth and legend. Lochs are Scotland's gift to the world. They're a product of an element that we have in spectacular abundance, water. It's been estimated that there are more than 31,000 lochs in Scotland. They come in all shapes and sizes, from long fjord-like sea lochs, great freshwater lochs of the central highlands, to the innumerable lochens that stud the open moors. In this series, I'm on a loch hopping journey across Scotland, discovering how they've shaped the character of the people who live close to their shores. For this grand tour, I'm exploring the origins of a mythic world, as I follow a loch from sea to mountain. destination for this grand tour is Argyll and Loch Etiv, which runs from the White Dogs of Connell through the lands of Lorne before turning northeast towards the high mountains of Glencoe. Loch Etiv is a classic fjord and was fashioned by ancient glaciers that scoured out the landscape as they made their way slowly to the sea. The untamed shores of Upper Loch Etiv are truly remote. There is no public road into this wilderness and no settlements along its farthest reaches. The loch meets the sea and the Firth of Lorne at its narrowest point, where the early gales settled 1,600 years ago. They called their kingdom Dalriata, and its history is populated with heroes and their mighty deeds. The narrowest part of the loch is the closest to the sea. Today, it's spanned by a bridge at Connell. Connell means the white dogs in Gaelic, so called because of the tidal race that rips through the narrows at an incredible 12 knots. The white dogs are known in English as the Falls of Laura, and when the tide is running, the dogs become a playground for the brave. is in full flood and to watch the sport I've joined kayaker Dave Blizzard on a powerboat in the middle of the falls. The Loch Etive runs about 15 miles up behind you up to Tenult and then all the way up to the head of the loch and the tide drops today it's dropping by about three meters in height so all that volume of water three meters of all the, the surface area of Loch Etive has got to all compiling through this gap. But it's amazing the force of water that we're, we're looking at here this great boils erupting on the surface, as if there's something alive down there. Yeah, the, the bottom's not flat, so there's pinnacles and hollows, and it forces the water up and it forces it down, and yeah, it's, not, it's just not a straight run through at all. Now, if you were in a kayak over there, what kind of challenges are you faced with? St <laughs> Staying upright is the first of them. There's plenty of boils and things that are going to push your boat around, push you sideways. But this is strictly for experts, I'm guessing. Yeah, the, the boys that will be on here today are some of Scotland's top paddlers, uh -huh. absolutely. Oh. oh, he's gone, he's gone. He's back up again. Oh, dear <laughs> indeed. That water's gone right up his nose. I thought he was a goner for a moment. It's amazing how quickly they can recover. Oh. Some of the kayakers are making use of an unusual two-metre wave that's formed under the bridge. That's a big wave, it is, yes. but it's not actually moving anywhere, is it? It's a standing wave. Yeah. So yeah. that's like quite a strange phenomenon, is it not? Well, it, 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 in ocean terms it is, in river terms it's not. We get a lot of waves on, on a river that stand still. And so it, it is, it's a river feature on the sea. So you'll be able to have lots of opportunity as a kayaker to just constantly surf this wave. Yep and it's not going to ever break and reach its shore. No, that's right. 
It's hardly surprising that the early traveller, Dorothy Wordsworth, never forgot the Falls of Laura. In 1803, she and her brother, the poet William Wordsworth, crossed in an open boat with their horse and trap. The horse fretted and stamped its feet against the bare boards. The tide was rushing violently in making a strong eddy so that the motion, the noise and foam terrified him still more. And we thought that it would be impossible to keep him in the boat. Fortunately, they just managed to stop the horse from jumping overboard and capsizing the boat. But guess what? They never took a Highland ferry again. Paddling at slack tide, with the fury of the falls but a memory, I make my way to one of the most ancient castles in Scotland. The imposing fortress of Dunstaffnage has guarded the entrance to Loch Etif for centuries. In the Middle Ages, Dunstaffnage became a centre of Clan MacDougall power. Now, unfortunately, they backed the wrong side in the wars of Scottish independence and were defeated by Robert the Bruce, who confiscated their lands and gave them to their arch-rivals, Clan Campbell, who've reigned supreme here ever since. With so much Campbell history imbued in its ancient walls, Dunstaffnage is a place of legends, where the past and the supernatural seem to be ingrained into the very fabric of the building. Lorne McIntyre has known the castle since he was a boy. Having spent his formative years in its shadow, the place and its Campbell keepers have left a great impression on him. Now, Lauren, you've known Dunstaffnish since you were a boy, is that not right? Yes, we grew up beside Angus Campbell, the 20th hereditary captain of Dunstaffnish, as he never failed to remind people. Right. My grandmother was his housekeeper in the mansion house, which burnt down in 1940, and she was really, for the rest of his life, his confidant and looked after him. He's a very colourful character. He was a very, very colourful character. He was, I would call, one of the last of the traditional lairds. He was steeped in his own heritage, but also very much steeped in a kind of Celtic, mystical, supernatural heritage. He, he lived, I think, in a world of ghosts, and he lived in a world of rituals. When you walked up the avenue with him in the twilight and the moon was rising, he insisted on stopping and opening his spurn and turning the coins over because he had a superstition about that. And when you were in my grandmother's kitchen when he was taking his coffee, you didn't look at the new moon through glass. Right, why was that? Because he thought it would bring misfortune onto you. He was em enormously superstitious. He believed somehow that these supernatural apparitions, and there were apparitions, were part of his heritage, like the paintings on the walls, and therefore just to be accepted. The Captaincy of Dunstaffnage is a hereditary title granted by the Campbell Duke of Argyll. In addition to a peppercorn rent, the captains are traditionally obliged to spend each Midsummer's Night in the Gatehouse, which has the reputation for being haunted by a poltergeist. So he come here by himself on a camp bed and spend Midsummer's Night here. He came here and he had a torch. He had the West Highland Terrier to, uh -huh. al to alert him if any ghosts should appear and disturb him. And then he put the light out, he stopped reading and he was fetched again in the dawn and taken back home. And my grandmother made sure that he had not been disturbed during the night by any spectral in interventions. And were there any spectres that he might have seen, do you think? Well, the principal one is a lady called the Elle Maid. I'm not quite sure how she gets her name, but she seems to have been a very real presence in this castle down the centuries. And one of the attributes, according to tradition of the Elle Maid, is that she has a man's tread, a heavy man's tread. What about you, Long? Would you spend the night here? I don't think so. From what I know of the place and what I have actually heard and, and read, I think I would have to have people with me and perhaps a very, very good guard dog. That is spooky. That is very spooky. Out of a strange sense of bravado, 
I've decided to spend the night in the gatehouse. I'm doing this not to challenge the claim of the Campbell Keepers of Dunstaffnage, but to see if it's possible to get a good night's sleep in such an ancient and haunted place. <laughs> According to Lorne, the L maid announces her presence with the sound of very heavy footsteps, which is bad news if you're unlucky enough to hear them. So I've got these earplugs just in case. And as an added precaution, in case I see anything that's particularly ghoulish and disturbing, I've got this eye mask. So, time for bed. Ah, 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 <sighs> exhausted. sleep, I leave Dunstaffnage and its supernatural connections and continue my journey eastwards up Loch Etive, heading to Banor and the village of Tainault, where I come across a little-known monument with legendary connections. This standing stone, curiously called the Nelson Stone, was the first ever monument erected to the memory of Admiral Lord Nelson after his death at the Battle of Trafalgar. So what, you might well ask, has a Highland village got to do with a one-armed, one-eyed naval hero? And the answer, of course, is balls. Cannonballs, to be precise. Remarkably, some of the cannonballs fired by the Royal Navy at Trafalgar could well have been made from iron smelted here on the shores of Loch Etif. At Bonor are the impressive remains of an iron foundry built in the 18th century. These days, it's also a museum. Now this is a rare and rather unexpected example of early industry in the Highlands. And this is a lump of iron slag, the waste product from the smelting process. It's rough and quite heavy and you find it on the ground everywhere around here. Now, the iron ore itself actually came all the way from Cumbria, brought here by the iron masters for the smelting process. And the reason they chose Loch Etif was because of this stuff, charcoal, which came from the trees round about. To find out more about charcoal making, which kept an army of men busy in the oak forests of Etif, I meet up with one of the few charcoal makers left in Scotland. Alastair Eckersall is a ranger with the National Trust for Scotland. He combines charcoal making with woodland conservation. This is a kiln, a charcoal kiln. That's right. Well, I have to say, it doesn't look quite as high tech as I imagined. It's basically just a big oil drum, is it not? It is indeed. Uh, but it's higher tech than you would have come across in uh, days gone by. But there's certainly more advanced ways of making charcoal these days, right enough. Now, what exactly is charcoal? So charcoal is just the, the carbon element of wood. Uh, if you take a piece of wood and you burn it without the presence of oxygen, everything else in the wood will disappear and you're left with the, the carbon skeleton of that uh, piece of wood. So how do you take the oxygen out of the equation then? By getting a, a, a good hot fire going, but in a controlled fashion. So using a kiln like this, we can seal out most of the air, just to let a small amount of air in. The next phase of operations is to stack the kiln, which means that we actually have to climb inside it to lay the wood, which Alistair's volunteers have prepared, a task that would have been familiar to charcoal makers of old charcoal making families would have just lived in the woods. Some of the, the archive photos, you'll see the, the very basic stone and little, little thatched huts that they uh -huh. would uh, build themselves in the woods. And the whole family would live like that? The whole family would live there. Uh -huh. The nature of charcoal making then meant they had to be on site all the time watching, uh -huh. their, uh, watching their burn. <laughs> The team 
keeps feeding us with wood, and gradually the level rises. I'm then granted the honor of removing the center pool and pouring burning embers into the space to set the fire. And how long will this burn for? This is going to burn for about 14, 15 hours. With the lid in place and sealed with mud, the burn will need to be tended carefully and the airflow adjusted using four pipe chimneys to make sure the wood doesn't turn to ash. After the smoke finally clears the following morning, I join an anxious Alistair to lift the lid on his charcoal-making skills. And this is the moment of truth. It certainly is. What's inside? <laughs> I thought there might just be a pile of ash. <laughs> But well, that's really impressive. That's, Alice, come, that's come away okay. Yeah, that is really that's really impressive. Not a bad burn. So you can see there how the wood's kept its integrity. We've still got the uh -huh. the shape of the yeah. original piece of wood, but everything else has gone out of it. And we've just left with the uh, the carbon. You can even see the the grains in the wood and the rings. It's really quite beautiful. It's almost like a work of art. It's amazing to think that Alistair's charcoal-making process links Loch Etif to the cannonballs fired by Nelson's fleet at the Battle of Trafalgar. As mist descends over the forest, I move on, heading to a place that continues to make use of the area's abundant resources, oakwood and salmon. At Inveraw Smokehouse, salmon and trout are prepared daily. Once filleted, the fish are placed on racks to be dried and cured, using the age-old process of cold smoking. That's yes, better. you're beauty. I help the owner, Robert Campbell Preston, to load up with freshly split oak logs. He then introduces me to the arcane art of smoking. The smoke goes under the floor here, uh, and then up through the kilns, uh -huh. and out through the roof. You know, it's very simple. Passing through the fish on its Bad way. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I'll just pull this out for you. Okay. Now, how you make the smoke is really with this little contraption down here. So is that controlling the air supply? That controls the air. Uh -huh. And when you're cold smoking and you don't want flame, you just mm -hmm. want smoke, every fire is different. You get to know the quirk of each fire. Uh -huh. Lift the lid off. So this is a 24-7 operation. Yeah. And the secret to good smoking, I think, is to keep stocking the fire every four hours. That's perfect. Now, what you need to do to make a good heart in your fire, what they always do is bang it, bang it, go on, bang it, bang it. That gets a good heart. It puts the wood down. I have heart to a fire. It's yeah. really important. Now, see how you're getting now, the smoke is increasing, even though the lid's off, the smoke's increasing because uh -huh. we've put fresh wood in. And obviously, the more, the fresher it is, the more smoke you get. And that's why it's so important that you stoke the fire every three to four hours. You love your smoke. Okay, yeah, you, you'd love it too. <laughs> right, lid on. Now, this is important too, again, controlling, because you could, that controls how the fire works. But where you place this in here mm -hmm. matters. Because remember, when we're smoking, we mustn't let the fish get warmer than 30 degrees. I'm smoking already, Robert. No, no, okay, push it in, push it in. Yeah. We'll push it in. That's it. It's on its way up. So you must, you must have shift work here. Oh, yes. 27 yeah. 7, yeah. Oh, that's seven. amazing. I've always, we've always got some. And the here. fires never but go night, out. But at night, we just stoke it down. And, and do they ever go out? Oh, yeah, of course they do. They well, do. Sometimes they sometimes go out. Sometimes. That's in. when the <laughs> boss starts shouting. <laughs> And it starts to get angry. <laughs> Why the fire go out? Why the fire? Who let the fires go out? You know, just like, like the wife at home. Who let the fire go out? You know what I mean? You're so, very passionate about this. I've never heard of someone speak so passionately about smoke in my life before. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? Leaving Robert in a cloud of his beloved wood smoke, I bid farewell to Inver taking a lovely side of smoked salmon a present for my dear old ma. Back on the water, I head further up the loch in the company of Natalie Hicks, a research scientist working with the Scottish Association of Marine Science. Natalie has been studying the extraordinary ecosystem hidden beneath the deep, dark waters of Loch Etif. 
So Natalie, we certainly picked the weather to be able to unlock Antif, which from a scientific point of view is a really unique lock. Yes, it did, and indeed, I mean, it's one of 110 sea locks that we have on the west coast of Scotland. And for scientists, this is particularly interesting because effectively we've got a marine dominated system in the lower basin here, and we've got a more freshwater dominated system in the upper basin, very much like a fjord you would find in Norway. So what does that mean in terms of the marine life that you might expect to find here? So we've got a few unique species in the loch. Uh, most of them you do find in the open oceans. For example, we've got a zooplankton population, a copepod population. And so zooplankton are found. They're small, um, they're small organisms that feed on phytoplankton. They form the basis of the food chain. There's a huge population in the loch. Really? It's an ideal environment mm -hmm. for them. So they can tolerate the changes in salinity and there's not many predators, but there's a lot of food. So what kind of abundance are you talking about? You can just uh, scoop it out of the water? You can scoop it out of the water and it looks like a pink soup because there's so many of them, it changes the colour of the water itself. I know you've got a net. And we have got a net. We're going to do some scooping. I think we should scoop some out and see if we can catch some. Excellent. The zooplankton we're after form an important part of the food chain. Their bodies have a very high omega oil content and it's what makes the fish that feed on them like herring and mackerel, so healthy to eat. Natalie's method of catching them takes me back to a happy childhood spent rock pooling with a shrimp net. Although this one is considerably longer and has a collection bottle at its base. You don't want to lose that, now, do you? No, definitely not. It's as simple as lowering the net into the depths and bringing it up to the surface. Here it comes. Have we got anything? Let's have a look. Let's tip it into a bucket and see what we've got. Oh, we've got a couple of jellyfish. <laughs> look, you can see them. Is that them? Yep, so all those little pinky the brownie pink colours. Yep, you can see them zipping around. Some of them are in clumps, and it, that's what gives the water the sort of pinkish brownish colour. Looks like we've got lucky and we've got two moon jellyfish as well. Do they stink? They, these ones don't sting us, so yeah, you're safe to pick these up. That's not a problem. There you go. Wow. You sure it doesn't stink? Yep. It doesn't stink. It doesn't stink, <laughs> folks. See? You can pick them up. Yeah, but, but only the moon jellyfish. Yeah, only the moon. <laughs> Don't pick any of the red ones up that you see around the coast. They definitely stink. I'm surprised to see so many of these tiny little... They look like little shrimps. They, they do, I'm and they move very shrimps. quickly, don't they? They and do. You... Do they bite? They don't bite. <laughs> I've never known of a copepod to bite a human. Let me see. Go on. Ouch! <laughs> <laughs> it got me. Leaving Natalie and her zooplankton, I head up lonely Glen Etif, a place which is steeped in the legends of the early Celts who settled here. I can see why the landscape fed into the collective mythology. This is a place that excites the imagination with every turn of the road, which eventually emerges onto the bleak expanse of Rannoch Moor. Few visitors who are unimpressed by the imposing mountains which dominate the moor, especially Bucholetif Moor behind me, which translates from the Gaelic as the big herdsman of Etif. To fully appreciate the epic scale of the Buchol, which I have to say is my favourite mountain in the whole of Scotland. I'm meeting up with Murray Wilkie, who specialises in taking extraordinary mountain photographs. His secret is to capture them in the magical light of dawn, sunset or both. But to do this, he goes to exceptional lengths. I'm joining him on a trek to the summit of a hill overlooking the Buco. The plan is to camp at altitude. So what's the idea behind this high-level camping, Murray? Well, it's uh, the views you get, I think. The sunsets and the sunrises, when you get them, you just can't beat it. It's the best light. You get great views, but when you get the light, it's just amazing. It's a real privilege to be up here. I'm not quite so sure about the privilege of camping up here. <laughs> we'll have to see how well, that goes. Let's see. There it is, the sunshine. That's what we want. Yeah. And that's what we're chasing. I think we might get a view in a minute, the view we've not seen. 
just getting spectacular with every step, or more <laughs> spectacular with every step. Look at that, isn't it just? Some people wonder why you come to the mountains, and it's, uh, you don't really know until you get into these positions, do you? Such an impressive view, Murray. It's not bad, ben is it? Ben Nevis in front of us, look. Yeah, you can make out its north face and the memoirs in front of that. It's the Essians over there. That's right, and then if you go further round, you can see Ben Alder and right round to Shahalian again. And in front of us, we've got this great chasm, the beginning of Glencoe. Right. Sunset, which is what we've come for, isn't too far away. But there's still time to put up the tent and have a blether before the magic hour arrives. It's the first serious mountain I ever climbed. Oh, really? When I was a wee boy, yeah. yeah. I was about 13 or 14, and I was scared, rigid. Curved ridge in early December. Right. Snow and ice. I was dragged wow. up there, kicking and screaming. <laughs> but I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And we got yeah, to the yeah. summit as the sun was going down. So wow. in a way, watching the sun go down behind the book was kind of reliving that. For yeah, me. yeah. Have you got any favourite mountains that you've climbed and managed to capture the essence yeah. of in your photography and your videos? I, yeah, I think um, the one that stands out, I think I did a wild camp on top of Ben Allegan, which is up mm -hmm. in Torridon. And it was getting dark, and I looked outside back at the summit, and I saw a wee flash. Uh -huh. Somebody's out taking pictures already, so I thought, right, I'll, I'll get out, and I started taking the pictures. And it's, as I scanned north, took a picture looking, you can just see, you couldn't see with the naked eye, because it was still quite light. There was a wee band of green, and just as the night progressed, the, the lights became visible to the... What, the northern lights? The northern lights, the aurora borealis, yeah, became... You know, you, you often see them on the cameras, but you can't uh -huh. see them with uh -huh. the, the naked eye. This is a probably the f only one of three times that I've seen them with the, with the yeah. naked eye. No, the only time I've seen them on top of the mountain. And it's spectacular didn't... though. Oh, it was amazing. Yeah. But it's strange because I mean, doing what we're doing, it's well, the way that you do it is essentially a very solitary pastime. Yeah. But you're not a solitary person. Well, is it, do you come up here to contemplate? Do you feel because you're up high somehow, you know, you're on the summit of the gods, I mean, <laughs> you're looking down on the rest of humanity? Because <laughs> no. we are. You see the cars driving past down there on the A82, yeah. tiny wee things, and we're up here. For me personally, um, not that I'm not enjoying your company tonight, but I do like it when I'm by myself and I don't meet another soul. There's something, you, you appreciate things as well, I think, um, when you do go back, back home. It's a bit of zen. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Wrong with a bit of zen. A bit of meditation, maybe. So, yeah. But look at it. I mean, you can't you can't argue with that, can you? We are exceptionally lucky. The clouds have kept away, allowing the dying rays of the setting sun to catch the buco. The great herdsman of Etif looks very imposing now. As I take a photograph to capture the essence of my favourite mountain. Now this has definitely been worth waiting for because I've never seen the Buko in this light before. He looks truly epic, a real giant, making this the perfect place for me to end my grand tour among the legends of the West. My next grand tour takes me to the far northwest, exploring both above and below the waves. 